ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணலாமே very good evening good, very good morning ma'am to all my dear students who have joined here through this youtube channel today we are going to have a wonderful session after completing cardiology completely and having a test and discussion today we are going to start with uh, another chapter rheuma uh, another chapter rheumatology and today we are going to have the first topic in that rheumatoid arthritis thank you ma'am for joining with us today among the among your busy schedule and uh, let uh, let me hand over the session to you ma'am thank you thank you so much welcome back all of you so today we'll start the session with rheumatology and first topic will be rheumatoid arthritis this is also again very high yielding and uh, if you remember the mcq points then you can just very easily clear the paper on rheumatology so let's begin with the topic rheumatoid arthritis but before we go into the rheumatoid arthritis proper i would like to give you a small introduction about arthritis how we classify it what is called as arthritis and how do you differentiate arthralgia and arthritis so we'll just begin with the basics yeah so a small approach to the arthritis what is arthralgia and what is arthritis how do you differentiate these two yes i would like some interaction in the chat so what is arthralgia and what is arthritis yes so arthralgia is nothing but joint pain right arthralgia is nothing but joint pain then you may say arthritis also has joint pain right joint pain both are there but inflammation is present in which one so inflammation is present in which one it is in arthritis so inflammatory joint pain is called as arthritis arthralgia is just joint pain with no inflammation there will be no swelling there will be no swelling no redness all the signs of inflammation will be absent right that is arthralgia inflammation and joint pain is called as arthritis and more so in arthritis what will you have yes you will have what will you have you will have limitation of movements in arthritis you will have limitation of joint movements yes that's right uh, that's right dr raghu so you will have limitation of joint movements in arthritis so difference between arthralgia and arthritis is that both will have joint pain but signs of inflammation are absent in arthralgia whereas signs of inflammation are present in arthritis associated with a limitation of joint movements so this is called arthritis yes okay next coming to the main thing what is the classification how do you classify arthritis you can classify this in multiple ways but i will tell you more, the most important ones in uh, by which how you should classify this okay so the first one classification will be arthritis will be inflammatory or non inflammatory right inflammatory or non inflammatory so among the non inflammatory which is easy to remember i will shall, i will just show you what is the first one that is non inflammatory yes osteoarthritis the first one will be the most important one will be osteoarthritis then trauma induced arthritis traumatic arthritis or trauma induced arthritis okay suppose you develop a trauma in the left knee joint and then that becomes arthritic at a later phase so that is called trauma induced arthritis the next one will be coagulopathy induced coagulopathy induced so suppose the patient is hemophilic and there is bleeding into the joint right with continuous bleeding and what happens is there is it is a non inflammatory arthritis okay so coagulopathy induced arthritis especially hemophilia right especially hemophilia okay so now coming on to the inflammatory arthritis so among the inflammatory arthritis how do you differentiate it so the first one will be immune mediated right immune mediated and among that which is the most important one for you to remember which is the most important immune mediated arthritis yes and the topic of discussion today that is rheumatoid arthritis this is very very important so immune mediated inflammatory arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis most importantly non inflammatory arthritis the most important one will be osteoarthritis right 
to get it. So the first one will be in immune mediated inflammatory arthritis that is rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So the next one will be, how do you classify this? This will be erosive and non-erosive, right? Non-erosive. Yes. So among the immune mediated arthritis, I told you, you, you need to remember aromatoid arthritis. But is it erosive arthritis or non-erosive arthritis? What do we mean by erosive? That is the joint, the joint, there will be erosion in the joint, right? So is it an erosive arthritis or a non-erosive arthritis? Yes. Rheumatoid arthritis will be an if yes, erosive arthritis will be rheumatoid arthritis and non-erosive arthritis will be most importantly lupus induced arthritis. Yes, lupus induced arthritis. That's right. Okay. So moving on to the next one. This is immune mediated. So what is the next one? Infective. So infective arthritis. So what is infective arthritis? Yes. So infective will be, you will have bacterial infections. Yes. Protozoal infections, fungal arthritis, all these are very important. Sometimes you also have mycobacterial arthritis, mycobacterium tubercular arthritis. So all these are inflammatory arthritis, right? They, all these are inflammatory arthritis. Yes. The next one will be crystal induced. Crystal induced, we all know the two most important things, gout and pseudogout. Gout and pseudogout. So there are a few things that you must remember for sure. First is inflammatory arthritis and non-inflammatory arthritis. Among that, the most important inflammatory arthritis, immune mediated will be rheumatoid arthritis, which is erosive arthritis. Non-erosive is lupus erythematosus. Then infective, then crystal induced. Among that, it will be gout and pseudogout. Among the non-inflammatory, the most important one will be osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis. Yes. If those, uh, yeah, Dr. Kavya is asking if those, if there's no inflammation, then what's the difference between OA and arthralgia? In OA, there will be some amount of joint destruction will be there, but it is not inflammatory, right? There will be some degenerative changes happening in the uh, joint, which will cause the arthritis, but it is non-inflammatory. There are no re reactive responses, like there is no uh, redness, swelling, all those things will not be there. But there will be some amount of joint destruction or joint degeneration will be there. In arthralgia, you won't have any of those things. It will be just joint pain. Okay, like suppose you have a fever and you have multiple body aches. Um, in that time, you will also have some kind of joint pain, right? So that is come sometimes called an arthralgia. Okay, yes. And arthralgia is a most, mostly a symptom and arthritis is a sign, right? Arthralgia is a symptom. Even if you have an inflammatory arthritis or non-inflammatory arthritis, you will have arthralgia. You may have a joint pain, but we don't know whether it is inflammatory or not until we go into the depths. So, arthralgia is a symptom, whereas arthritis becomes a sign. Okay? I hope I've answered your question, Dr. Kavya. Yeah. So, let's proceed. So, this is one type of classifying the arthritis. So, what is the next type of classifying? You can also say whether the onset is when you're a child or when you're an adult. So, is it juvenile or adult? So among the juvenile ones, the most important one will be JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And the adults, it will be something like RA, rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, gout, pseudogout, anything. So all these things are adult-induced, adult, -induced, adult uh, development of arthritis and juvenile will be juvenile idiopathic arthritis most commonly. right? So the other way of classifying can also be whether it is oligoarticular, oligoarticular or monoarticular or polyarticular. So when you think about monoarticular, the most common one that you will be thinking will be trauma-induced. You have trauma over one knee joint. So the arthritis will be over that knee joint only. It will not be present in all other joints. So the trauma-induced arthritis is most likely a monoarthritis, monoarticular involvement. And one more thing which we commonly think about is gout because the most one will be the metacarpophalangeal, meta, metatarsophalangeal joint so the toe, first toe, big toe is the most common area. And most often it is the only joint which is involved. So it will be gout. But gout can occur in multiple joints as well. But the most commonly what we see will be a monoarticular involvement. So polyarticular, we already know it is like rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. Right? So this is about the joint involvement. How do we classify based on the joint involvement? Is it oligoarticular, monoarticular or polyarticular? Okay? Yes. 
So let's go to rheumatoid arthritis proper. Okay. So what is rheumatoid arthritis? We already saw it is an immune mediated, right? Immune mediated and erosive arthritis. Erosive polyarthritis. Yes, polyarthritis. Yes, we already know this much information from what we have studied now. Right. So let us now proceed. So in whom is this rheumatoid arthritis most common? Is it an inflammatory disease? Yes. So it is an inflammatory arthritis. Inflammatory arthritis. It is inflammatory. Then it is also a systemic disease. It is also called a systemic disease. So why do I call rheumatoid arthritis as a systemic disease and not just a joint-based disease? Because a rheumatoid arthritis also has some extra articular manifestations, right? Rheumatoid arthritis has some extra articular manifestations, okay? So, because of extra articular manifestations, extra articular manifestations are there. We'll go into the depth on what are, what are the extra articular manifestations. So, most importantly, we need to remember uh, rheumatoid arthritis is not just a joint disease. It is a systemic disease. It is an inflammatory systemic disease, okay? And which are the joints that it affects? It affects the synovial joints. It affects the synovial joints. And it has a variable expression. Okay. It has a variable expression. So, what do we mean by variable expression? In few people, it will be just one joint involved. In few people, it will be more than one joint involved. In few people, it may involve more than 10 joints. Okay. So, it has a variable expression. And we don't know who will react in what way. So, there is a variable expression. And in whom is it most commonly found? It is most commonly found in females. Females to males. Females more than males. What is the ratio? It is nearly 3 is to 1. It is 3 times more common in females than males. Right? It is more 3 times more common in females than in males. Okay? And next, what will be the age group? So, what is the age group where it develops? It is most commonly seen in those between 25 to 50 years. 25 to 50 years is the most common age group of patients developing rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes you can also have it in juvenile period. So that will be juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Earlier it was called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It, earlier it was called JRA, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. But now we have termed it as JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Right? So there is an onset juvenile also in the early childhood. So that will be juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Right? So that is juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So it's an inflammatory, immune-mediated, erosive polyarthritis with a systemic component because of extra-articular manifestations. It involves the synovial joints. It's more common in the females, especially in the age group between 25 to 50 years. There is a juvenile component also. Earlier, we used to call it juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, but now it has been termed as juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This entirely is not rheumatoid arthritis. That's why they have termed it differently. But you must remember that this was earlier a component of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, yes. So let's move on to the, yes, this is what I've told you. It's a systemic chronic inflammatory disease with variable expression. It's common in females with a ratio of 3 is to 1, right? Yes. Now coming to the etiology. Coming to the etiology. So here I have put up a chart, but most importantly, what you must remember that it is a big multi-cascade system of events which actually precipitate in rheumatoid arthritis. There are many triggers which are happening. But for the triggers to work on you, what you should be having, you should have a genetic predisposition, right? You must have a genetic predisposition. Yeah. So in this genetic predisposition, what do we say? So when do you say that you have a hereditary predisposition? That is when you have HLA, DR, B104 or HLA, DR, B101. Yes, HLA, DR. B101. When you have this genetic problem, when you have this genetic predisposition, then you are more prone for developing rheumatoid arthritis. Right? When you are more prone for developing this arthritis. So, hereditary predisposition is one. Yes? This is one. Environmental triggers are the second one. Environmental triggers are the second one. The third one will be infections. Yes? The third one are infections. Okay. Among the environmental triggers, which is the most important one? Smoking. Yes. Smoking is a very, very, very important trigger for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So you need to have a genetic predisposition with an environmental trigger or an infection happening, which actually precipitates this rheumatoid arthritis in the patients. Okay. So when you have all these things, what happens? The CD4 cells are activated. 
yes the cd4 positive t cells are activated so what happens because of this we have seen that it is a systemic involvement and it is a joint involvement so what should happen and i also told you that it's an immune mediated response so when this t cell gets activated when this t cell gets activated it also activates the b cells so what happens because of that rheumatoid factors are produced ra factor is produced ra factor is produced so because of that what happens immune complexes are formed okay immune complexes are formed i told you it is an immune mediated process right so immune complexes are formed you have understood this part because of t cell activation b cell activation occurs rheumatoid factor is produced immune complex formation occurs right this is the important one after that it what does it do it activates the endothelial cells it activates the endothelial cells when the endothelial cells get activated there is a recruitment of inflammatory cells all the wbcs come into that place which cause destruction of the bone and cartilage right it causes destruction of the bone and the cartilage right yes and it also activates the macrophages what does it do the t cells also activate the macrophages when the macrophages are activated in the presence of interleukin 1 and tnf alpha this is very important for you to remember because when you go into the treatments you will see that these are all important yeah so interleukin 1 and tnf alpha are activated so because of that the chondrocytes osteoblast and the osteoclastic activity is all enhanced because of that what happens the destruction of the bone and cartilage happens right and because of the system because of the recruitment of inflammatory cells in various systemic places you have systemic involvement extra articular manifestations are also there yeah so it's an immune complex mediated because of the formation of rheumatoid factor mainly and which is the interleukin that is involved interleukin 1 and tnf alpha these factors are involved in mediating this process of injury and endothelial cell activation happens because of that there is recruitment of inflammatory cells the wbc is poured into that region and and the macrophage activation actually causes joint destruction so big destruction of the bone and cartilage happens because of this uh, because of this problem with the macrophage activation yes so what happens what happens because of that yes so there is inflammation of there is invasion of inflammatory cells invasion of inflammatory cells inflammation invasion of inflammatory cells where do these go these go into the synovium right these go into the synovium so the synovium is now come uh, filled with neutrophils this synovium is now filled with neutrophils right so this causes the inflammation this causes inflammation this causes inflammation yeah then what happens more cytokines are produced interleukin 1 plus tnf alpha all these cytokines are produced what happens this inflammation will be increasing this inflammation will be more and more increasing yeah this will also produce some enzymes which will actually enhance the inflammation right so this all mainly because of the invasion of the inflammatory cells into the synovium right so all these are the pathology or the etiology of how it happens how does how is this uh, you know process manifested yeah so now let us go on interleukin 1 this is very important interleukin 1 and tnf alpha it activates mono monocytes and macrophages which causes inflammation it causes fibroblast proliferation because of that synovial pannus formation occurs we'll go in that detail then activates chondrocytes then cartilage breakdown happens chondrocytes cartilage breakdown happens and also activates the osteoclast because of which the bone resorption occurs so what all the effects of this interleukin 1 activation in rheumatoid arthritis you have inflammation you have pannus formation the cartilage breaks down and the bone gets resorbed so because of this bone resorption that is why we call it as erosive arthritis right you remember now these terms make sense to you i hope this erosive arthritis is because of the bone resorption happening because of the activation of osteoclasts by the activation of interleukin 1 right so it is called an erosive arthritis bone resorption happens okay we'll see that in the further x rays also okay so bone resorption erosive cartilage breakdown happens synovial pannus formation occurs because of fibroblast proliferation locally and there is an inflammation because of activation of monocytes or macrophages neutrophils all those things right okay now let us move on let me show you this image so what is this this is a healthy joint so in this you can see that there is a beautiful capsule the cartilage is here and this is synovial membrane the synovial membrane is covering right 
So this is a healthy joint. You have a joint capsule, you have a cartilage, you have a synovial membrane covering everything. Right. So what happens in rheumatoid arthritis? What happens in rheumatoid arthritis? In rheumatoid arthritis, you have, there is destruction of the cartilage. Like we just saw, because of the chondrocyte activation, you have the destruction of the cartilage. Then, because of the infiltration of synovial, in, infiltration of neutrophils into the synovium, the synovial fil, fluid becomes very thick or there is a lot of cellular activity in the synovial fluid. So, you will have a lot of inflammatory cells, a lot of neutrophils in the synovial fluid. A lot of neutrophils will be there in the synovial fluid. Why does this happen? Why is the joint secretion, the fluid secretion is more? Because the synovium is inflamed. Here, the inflamed synovial membrane is there. You can see the joint, the synovial membrane is so much inflamed, right? And there is panis. What is it? There is a panis, right? Panis formation happens. So, what are all the effects? There is synovial fluid, a synovial membrane gets thickened because of that, the synovial fluid. Uh, is produced more and what is the major component of the synovial fluid there will be more number of neutrophils there is destruction of cartilage and there is panis formation there is panis pan formation okay there is panis formation okay so let's move on this is the yeah so what is the joint symptoms what are the signs and symptoms first of all what happens to the joint inflammation the joint inflammation will always be symmetrical it will most often be symmetrical. What do, what do I mean by symmetrical? When the right knee joint is involved, the left knee joint will also be involved. When the small fingers of this hand are involved, the joint, this joint small, small joints of this hanger, hand are also involved. So both sides happen always together. So it is a symmetrical arthritis. Symmetrical arthritis. Yes. So you will have the joint signs of inflammation. So you will have the signs of inflammation like Rubert, Caller, Dollar, all those things you will have. So you will have swelling. Redness, pain, tenderness, all these things will be there, right? You will have all the signs of inflammation. Symmetrical arthritis, you will have signs of inflammation also. And most importantly, what is the primary symptom of this rheumatoid arthritis? It is called morning stiffness, right? It is called morning stiffness. So, when the patient wakes up in the morning, he will say that I am not able to close my fingers. I am not able to hold a glass of water when I am trying to hold the water in the morning when I wake up. So, this lasts for about at least an hour. And then as the day progresses, I feel much better. Okay, this is the characteristic symptom that they say. Yes, this is the characteristic symptom that they say. So, during the morning when I wake up, I am finding it very difficult to even stretch my fingers or stretch my legs. And gradually as the day progresses, the pain or the tend or the stiffness reduces. What is this called? This is called as morning stiffness, right? This is more than an hour, more than one hour in rheumatoid arthritis. You may ask me that this morning stiffness is also seen in osteoarthritis, right? This is also seen in osteoarthritis. But this osteoarthritis lasts less than half an hour. Less than half an hour. So the duration of stiffness will be less osteoarthritis. Morning stiffness, it will be more than one hour, that is rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so this is a very, very important symptom that you must remember. Morning stiffness, characteristic, you will find it in the MCQ. Morning stiffness lasting for, lasting for at least 15 minutes to one hour per day. Or morning stiffness less than 20 minutes per day will be osteoarthritis. Okay, so rheumatoid arthritis will be symmetrical. That also you need to remember with signs of inflammation. Right? Yes. And so, how is the joint involvement? It will be mostly 75% will be polyarticular involvement, right? Polyarticular involvement will be there. Polyarticular involvement will be there. Which are the most common joints involved? I told you the small joints of the hands, right? Small joints of hands are most commonly involved. But the exception is that no DIP involvement, no distal interphalangeal joint involvement. This distal interphalangeal joint will not be involved in rheumatoid arthritis. If at all it is involved, what is it? It is either a psoriatic arthritis or an osteoarthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, there will be no DIP involvement, no distal interphalangeal joint involvement. This you must be very, very clear because in the MCQs, you have to differentiate between whether it's an osteoarthritis or a rheumatoid arthritis because the patient will have fever. The age group will be probably 50 years, which is dicey. But they will say that there is no DIP involvement. Or they will say DIP involvement if it is an osteoarthritis case. Right? 
So there will be no DIP involvement. This you have to remember very, very clearly. There is no DIP involvement, no distal interphalangeal joint involvement. Sometimes it can also be monoarticular. In 25% of the cases, it can be monoarticular also. Monoarticular also. In that case, it will be either one shoulder, one knee joint, or one hip joint. One of these will be there. But the more, among the monoarticular, the most common will be knees, and the second common will be the shoulders. Right? So the, among the monoarticular, the most important one will be the knee. Among the monoarticular, the most common one will be the knee. Right? So 75% it will be polyarticular, but a small percentage will can also be presenting monoarticular. Okay? Among the monoarticular, the most important one will be the knee joint. Right? Yes. So this is the presentation. So moving on to the next part, what will happen because of the joint inflammation and the joint you know, destruction, there are some deformities which are produced, which, which you must be remembering by names. So I put up some photographs so that you will remember easily. Okay, you will have some photographic memory also. Okay, so in the rheumatoid hand, first of all, what will be happening? There will be a synovitis, right? There will be a synovitis will be there. So because of that synovitis, you can see that this repeated synovitis and inflammation and how scarring will be there. What will happen? There will be inflammation. There will be healing. Inflammation, healing will be there. When the process continues, what will happen? The bone gets destroyed. Yes, the cartilage, the joint gets destroyed because of that. So we'll, when, uh, when there is re recurrent synovitis happening, what happens? There is a prominent ulnar styloid. You can see here the prominent ulnar styloid will be there. Right? Prominent ulnar styloid will be there. Right? And the next important one will be radial deviation. There will be radial deviation. Because there, the tendon will be pulled to one side here. There will be radial deviation. Radial deviation will be happening. Then there will be ulnar deviation. Ulnar deviation at the metacarbophalangeal joints. The wrist will be radially deviated. But the, um, but the metacarbophalangeal joints, there will be ulnar deviation. Right? The, in the wrist, there will be radial deviation. Whereas at the metacarbophalangeal joints, at this region, at this region, you will have an ulnar deviation. Okay, you must remember this. In the wrist, it will be a radial deviation, whereas in a metacarbophalangeal joint, you will have ulnar deviation. Okay, this difference you must remember. In all the regions, all this is because of multiple uh, happenings of synovitis, right? So, in the wrist, it will be radial deviation. In the uh, in the metacarbophalangeal joint, you will have an ulnar deviation, right? Yes. So, in this region, you can see an inflamed PIP joint. I told you, see here, the DIP joints are absolutely normal, right? So this will be rheumatoid arthritis only if the DIP joints are not involved, right? Yes. So this is inflamed synovium. Then in you have something called botanized deformity and swan neck deformity. So what is uh, botanized deformity and what is swan neck deformity? In the proximal interphalangeal jaw joints, you have a, if, you have, if you have a fixed flexion deformity, you have a fixed flexion deformity. Fixed flexion deformity, then it is called, see it will be something like this, right? It will be something like this. So this is called botanist deformity. When you have something like this, a swan neck deformity, so that is called as fixed extension deformity. Fixed extension deformity. Why, why do we call this a swan neck? Because the DIP joint is normal, but you can see that the metacarpo, this first uh, proximal interphalangeal joint is extended. In this, you can see that it is completely flexed, whereas in this, it will be extended. Okay, this, this DIP joint will be normal, but this, Proximal interphalangeal joint will go into fixed extension. So this is called as swan neck deformity. Swan neck deformity. Then one, one more thing that you have to remember is the Z deformity. Z deformity. Yes, this is the Z deformity in the thumbs. Z deformity in the thumbs. So what are all the deformities that we have learned? At the wrist, there can be a prominent ulnar styloid. Then at the wrist, radial deviation can happen. At the metacarbophalangeal joint, you can have an ulnar deviation of the fingers. In the proximal interphalangeal joint, you will have a botanic deformity or a fixed flexion deformity. In the, uh, you can also have a fixed extension deformity or the swan neck deformity. And at the thumb, you will have a Z deformity. And the thumb, you will have a Z deformity. Right? Yes. Now, coming to the, uh, what happens in the legs. So, what is this called? This one. This again, the first joint is involved. The uh, distal joint will not be involved. Right? So what is this called? This is called a hammer toe. This is called a hammer toe. Okay? This is called a hammer toe. The second most important thing will be a baker's cyst. What is this? Baker's cyst. 
the most important involvement is this happens in the popliteal fossa. Yes, this happens in the popliteal fossa in the leg. What happens? This is because the excess joint, excess synovial fluid will be pushed out to form a cyst. The excess synovial fluid will be pushed out to form a cyst. This is called a Baker's cyst, right? So these are all the deformities that you find. Baker's cyst, the popliteal fossa and the hammer toe. Baker cyst and a hammer toe. These are the important manifestations in the leg, right? So I hope you remember. Let's revise the deformities once again because it's very, very important. At the wrist, you will have a prominent ulnar styloid, radial deviation at the wrist, ulnar deviation of the metacarpophalangeal joints, fixed flexion of the botanic deformity in the uh, proximal interphalangeal joints, fixed extension of swan neck deformity at the proximal interphalangeal joints and the Z deformity at the thumb. In the leg, you have a hammer toe and a Baker cyst, right? Yes. Now, moving on to the extra articular manifestations. So, when a patient comes to you with rheumatoid arthritis, initially he may have an articular manifestation only. But as the disease progresses and as age increases, the extra articular manifestation will tend to increase. Sometimes the first finding of the rheumatoid arthritis may even be with the presence of an extra articular manifestation only. The patient will present to you with ILD, and later you may go back and see that the patient actually has had rheumatoid arthritis. Right? So, this is very, very important. So, first of all, generally, what will you have? You will have constitutional symptoms like tiredness will be there. Tiredness will be there. You will have some lymphadenopathy, some general fever, yeah, some non no, I mean, no, no, non specific sign signs will be there. Signs will be there. So, you can have some non specific fever, tiredness, lymphadenopathy. All these are, these are some of the constitutional symptoms that you can find with rheumatoid arthritis. So, Coming to the skin, what will you find as an extra articular manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis? You will have nodules, rheumatoid nodules. These are very, very important. Rheumatoid nodules, right? Rheumatoid nodules. You can also have some erythema. Palmar erythema can be there. You can also have some vasculitis. Yes, vasculitis associated with the uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid vasculitis. So, this is very, very important. The two most important dermatologic manifestations will be nodules, erythema and vasculitis, right? Vasculitis, you may have some petechiae, you can have some vascular involvement, pain will be there over the skin, okay? So, these are all nodules, erythema or vasculitis. So, first one will be constitutional symptoms like tiredness, non-specific fever, lymphadenopathy. The dermatologic manifestation will be rheumatoid nodules, vasculitis and palmar erythema can be there. It's not that all of these should be there. Some of these will be there, right? So, coming to the ocular involvement. Ocular, it is very, very important. So, what is the first one among the ocular involvement? The first one will be dry eyes. Okay? Dry eyes. This is also called keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Okay? This is, all keracto, this is also called keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Okay? Because dry eyes are there in this patient. It can also be seen in Jogren syndrome, associated with Jogren syndrome. So, dry eyes is a, man a manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis in the eye. And the most important one will be episcleritis or scleritis, which will be presenting with a red eye. Right? So, episcleritis or scleritis. Episcleritis or scleritis is also very, very important. Sometimes what will happen? The sclera will become very, very thin. So, you will have a thin sclera. Thin sclera will be there. And the fourth one, the most important will be the colloid or the retinal nodules. Nodules. You saw the nodules on the skin. You will have some nodules on the choroid as well as the retina also. Choroid or the retina also. So, among the rheumatoid arthritis, nodules you will find over the skin as well as in the eye, choroid or the retina. Okay. You must remember nodules in three places. The skin, that is a dermatologic manifestation. In the eye, it will be either over the choroid or the retina. Okay, choroid nodules or the retinal nodules. This is very, very important. Ophthalmic, ophthalmic manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis is very, very frequently asked in the question. You will have like a patient presenting with episcleritis or scleritis and having joint manifestations. So, what is that diagnosis? That will be rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so this is important. Next, coming to the cardiac manifestations. Cardiac manifestations, again, here where you, what you will have, you will have nodules on the valves. Yes, nodules on the valves. Right, nodules on the valves. Then you will have pericarditis, which is very, very important. Pericarditis and myocarditis. This can also be there. So, where all have you seen the nodules now? Let us revise that. Nodules over the skin, eye, that will be choroid or the retina, choroid or retina, and the heart valves. 
right or the heart valves so these are the places where you get the rheumatoid nodules right so and pericarditis is very very frequent more than the nodules and the valves rheumatoid pericarditis is very very frequently happening coming to the neuromuscular manifestations you can see that all the systems are involved it is not only the joint you have constitutional symptoms you have skin ocular involvement cardiac involvement neuromuscular involvement hematologic pulmonary and some more manifestations are there right so you have you have a purely systemic inflammatory disease here right so coming to the neuromuscular features so what is it it presents with carpal tunnel syndrome most often it will present with a carpal tunnel syndrome it presents with a carpal tunnel syndrome or there can be some peripheral neuropathy or a mononeuritis multiplex okay so the nerves will be involved it is either peripheral neuropathy peripheral neuropathy can be there peripheral neuropathy can be there or there can be a mononeuritis multiplex right coming on to hematologic so what would you expect in hematologic i told you it's a chronic disease so when it is a chronic disease what will you expect you will expect some anemia yes and this anemia is characteristically anemia of chronic disease right so what is important about this anemia of chronic disease it will be a what is the anemia of chronic disease is it normocytic normochromic microcytic hemochromic what kind of anemia will this be can anyone tell me what kind of anemia will this anemia of chronic disease be i would like you to write it in the chat box we'll come back to that after we discuss this right so hematologic the most common will be anemia of chronic disease apart from that we'll also have some lymphomas we can also have some lymphomas right yes i want you to tell me anemia of chronic disease whether it will be microcytic hypochromic or normocytic normochromic or microcytic hypochromic what kind of changes will be there yes that's right you will also have an autoimmune hemolytic anemia dr pratik that you are very right you will have a warm uh, warm auto, auto auto antibody autoimmune hemolytic anemia can also be there i want to tell i want you to tell me how will the anemia of chronic disease be is it microcytic normocytic micro uh, my, uh, hypochromic or normochromic how will it be yeah we'll come back to that so pulmonary manifestations so there is something called felty syndrome right there is something called felty syndrome i'm sure all of you will be knowing this felty syndrome so what happens yes that's correct dr kavyan pratik it is normocytic normochromic it's normo normo normocytic normochromic but what happens in felty syndrome again it's a rheumatologic i mean it's a manifestation it's a hematologic manifestation in this what will you have what will have rheumatoid arthritis will be there in patients with rheumatoid arthritis when you have a neutropenia and also an organomegaly which organ that is splenomegaly right splenomegaly it's a triad of rheumatoid arthritis neutropenia and spleno splenomegaly you can see this one more hematologic manifestation we spoke about autoimmune autoimmune hemolytic anemia you can have lymphomas you can have anemia of chronic disease and you can also have neutropenia okay so felty syndrome rheumatoid arthritis plus neutropenia plus splenomegaly right so moving on to the further that is the pulmonary manifestations so what is the most important pulmonary manifestations ild right ild is the most important one ild is the most important one among that which is the most common one com most common pattern uip uip pattern is the most common happening okay apart from that you can also have pulmonary nodules yes let's let's include this under this list you can also have pulmonary nodules yes pulmonary nodules will be there right you can also have pleuritis you have pleuritis pericarditis is basically serositis right so pleuritis pericarditis will be there you can have nodules pulmonary nodules you can also have an effusion because of the inflammation you can have an effusion pleural effusion will be there it which will be mostly exudative exudative effusion will be there you can also have some lung fibrosis happening because of chronic ild right so you can have an interstitial lung disease you can have nodules you can have pleuritis right this is most common so coming on to the others you can also have sometimes a renal involvement yeah so you can have a renal involvement so you may think that it is not very common but what happens is like any chronic disease especially rheumatoid arthritis when it when the chronicity increases it tends to develop amyloidosis okay what does the, what happens you will develop amyloidosis okay this amyloidosis will present as proteinuria this amyloidosis will present as proteinuria as such the rheumatoid arthritis does not affect the renal pattern but if you have if the patient develops a chronic disease and it becomes amyloidosis then you will have a renal manifestation presenting with proteinuria 
Also, some of the drugs you must remember, which uh, suppose you treat the patient with NSAIDs, then the patient can have a renal involvement. Okay, so it is a because of the effect of the uh, treatment that can also happen. So amyloidosis, renal involvement will be there. You can have a secondary Jogren syndrome, right? You can have a secondary Jogren syndrome. I told you, you have the keratoconjunctivitis sicca. You can have a secondary Jogren syndrome associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Also, the patient will become so chronically ill. There will be a lot of deformities. The patient will not be able to move around and there will be a lot of muscle wasting, right? There will be a lot of muscle wasting. Yes, you're right, Dr. Pratik. It's Kaplan syndrome, correct. Okay. So, so amyloidosis, secondary Jogren syndrome, muscle wasting can be there. So, you can see that very clearly it is not a Articular involvement at all alone, it is an extra articular disease. It is a systemic disease, right? So you have manifestations all including all the systems of the body. Constitutional symptoms will be there: skin, ocular manifestations, cardiac manifestations, neuromuscular involvement, hematologic involvement, pulmonary, renal, all these are very, very important. Okay. So all these extra articular manifestations are important for you to remember because these will be pointers in your MCQs. You will be able to find out the disease based on the extra article manifestations in your MCQs. Okay, so let's move on. So how do we investigate these patients? How do we investigate these patients? So we have seen now what are the hematologic manifestations, right? So based on that, first of all, we'll do a CBC, right? First, we'll do a CBC. So what do you expect to find in this? You can either have a normocytic, normochromic anemia, right? Normocytic, normochromic anemia. Normocytic, normochromic anemia. You can have low platelets, low platelets, or you can have increased platelets. Thrombocytosis is more common in, thrombocytosis is more common in these patients, right? So increased platelets will be there. Then you can also have a microcytic anemia. You can also have a microcytic anemia because when the patient is given NSAIDs, the patient will have a GA blood loss. So in that case, you can have a microcytic anemia also. You already saw we can have neutropenia. And sometimes lymphomas can also be there. So you can have deranged WBCs also, total counts also. So CBC is very, very valuable, right? So the first one will be CBC. Next will be ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. As we all know, it will be elevated in any chronic disease. So ESR will be elevated. Along with that, the C-reactive protein will also be elevated. So these are all markers of inflammation, right? ESR and CRP will be elevated. So first we do the basic investigation, CBC, ESR and CRP. Okay. And we should we will be also doing the renal function test and the LFT. These are mainly, you know, to guide the treatment. Suppose you're giving NSAIDs or you're giving uh, demands, then you have to monitor the treatment. For that, you need to investigate the patient. You need to have a baseline of the LFT values and the RFT values, the renal functions and the liver functions. You need to have a, a baseline, right? So you do the CS, CBC, ESR, CRP, RFT, and LFT. These are all the basic ones. So next, moving on to the important ones. What are they? Rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP. What is anti-CCP? Anti-citrullinated, cyclic citrullinated peptide. Okay. And cyclic citrullinated, citrullinated peptide. So what is this rheumatoid factor? It is the IgM against the IgG. Okay. It is the IgM against the IgG, against an immunoglobulin, against the FC fragment of immunoglobulin, what happens? The, you know the fragments of the immunoglobulin, right? Against the, In the IgG, when there is an FC fragment, against that an antibody is formed. That is an IgM. This is called the rheumatoid factor, right? This is called the rheumatoid factor. This rheumatoid factor is positive generally in these patients, but it is not diagnostic, okay? This is positive in many patients, but it is not diagnostic, right? It is not diagnostic. It is not diagnostic. Okay. In around 80% of the cases, it will be positive. It can also be negative, then it becomes zero negative. Right. If it is negative, then it becomes zero negative. Right. So it is not diagnostic. 80% will be RA factor, RA factor will be positive, but it is not diagnostic. It only increases the, you know, the possibility of the diagnosis. Right. Next, moving on to, so when this rheumatoid factor is increased, what happens? Rheumatoid factor is increased. So the increase will show the severity of the disease, right? It will show the severity of the disease. If it is less increased, then it means the disease is less severe. If it is more, then if more, more number of faults, then it will be the severity of the disease will be more. So it will be more disease. 
and the rheumatoid factor is also associated with more extra articular manifestations more extra articular manifestations so the rheumatoid factor is associated with more extra articular manifestations okay so this is the importance of rheumatoid factor it is not specific the sensitivity is more it, but it is not specific right so it is not diagnostic also but when the rheumatoid factor is very high that means the disease is more severe or when it is more the extra articular manifestations will become more and more common right next moving on to anti ccp this is more positive this is more specific right this is more specific to um, rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis this is more specific to rheumatoid arthritis okay so anti ccp anti cyclic citrullinated peptide this is an, this is also an antibody which is specific to uh, rheumatoid arthritis so the important serological test that you will be doing is ra factor as well as anti ccp as well as anti ccp right okay so the next x-ray that we we'll, that we will be taking will be the the next uh, investigation that we will, that we will be doing will be the x-ray right next investigation we will do we will be doing will be the x-ray correct so what have we seen in the x-ray we remember that it was an erosive arthritis right it is an erosive arthritis so you can see here you will have some periarticular erosions will be there you can see periarticular what do i mean by periarticular this is the joint so this will be the joint around the joint you will have some periarticular osteopenia there will be bone joint destruction bone destruction in the periarticular region mainly you can see here also there is joint destruction there joint destruction is there right so this is called periarticular osteopenia periarticular osteopenia periarticular osteopenia okay yes so in this you will find the periarticular osteopenia in the hands x-ray what else will you be able to see you will be able to find the deformities right you will be able to find the deformities correct you will be able to find the deformities next what else will be will you be able to able to find if you take an x-ray of the spine you will be able to look for atlanto axial subluxation right so when the spine is involved you can have an atlanto axial subluxation this is very commonly found on the spine x-ray okay this you must be watchful about atlanta axial subluxation can be there right all these will be there so if you do a chest x ray you have seen that there is a systemic involvement right when you see a chest x ray there will be some reticular nodules will be there there will be reticular nodules you will have signs of ild reticular nodules will be there or you can have a pleural effusion right pleural effusion i told you pleural effusion is also manifestation pleuritis and pleural effusion will be there or there can be some fibrosis or ild that you can see okay so when you do a x ray of the hand or other joints you will have periarticular osteopenia you can also find out the deformities and if you do a spine x ray you will you will have a what do we say if you have a spine x ray you can do a you can see the subluxation of the joint subluxation of the joints will be there if you do a chest x ray you can see the ild pleural effusion and the fibrosis these are all very very important for you to be knowing so what are the investigations cbc esr crp the renal functions and the lft functions for a baseline then you will be doing the ra factor and anti ccp followed by the x rays x rays are very very important right so you will have periarticular osteopenia you can have the deformities on the spine you can also have the subluxation of the joints and the chest x ray you can find out pleural effusion you can have the ild findings also the some fibrosis will be there can be seen okay so all these are manifestations so moving on so you have seen what all are there but so how do we actually classify this rheumatoid arthritis how do we come to a diagnosis that it is rheumatoid arthritis all these may be there but you need to find out if it is really rheumatoid arthritis or not because most of these findings will be found in some other arthritis also right these extra articular manifestations can be found in some other arthritis also okay so suppose it is an sle that time also you will have a pleural effusion uh, pleural effusion can be there ild can be there but and the joint involvement can also be there but how will you say that this is rheumatoid arthritis so you have a criteria for diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis this is not diagnostic criteria this is a classification criteria you must remember that so based on the joint involvement so if it is a one large joint if it is mono articular right if it is mono articular then it is zero points because mono articular it is less common that it is rheumatoid arthritis okay so if it is 2 to 10 large joints then you give one point 2 to 10 large joints it is one point then if it is one to one to three small joints with or without any large joint involvement then you give three points small joints mainly because the fingers will be involved okay 
Then small joints meaning the fingers of the hand. If it is more than 10 joints with at least one small joint involvement, then you give a total score of 5. 5. This is the highest ranking because small joints are most frequently involved in rheumatoid arthritis. So more than 10 joints with at least one small joint involvement, then it means that it is more than 5. Okay. Then serology. You need at least one. So at least one of these are important. So you need to either have a negative RF. If it is a negative RF anti, negative anti-CCP antibody, then it's less likely that it is rheumatoid arthritis. Then a low positive rheumatoid factor with a low positive anti-CCP antibody, then it is 2. If it is high positive RF with a, or a high positive anti-CCP body, then it will be 3. So you need either low positive RF or low positive anti-CCP antibody to call it as, we call it with 2 points. If it is a high positive RF, then again you give 3 points. Or if it is high positive anti-CCP antibodies, then you give 3 points. Either one of these should be present for you to give those points. Right? Then moving on to the acute phase reactants. Then you need to, what are the acute phase reactants that we see here? ESR and CRP. Okay? ESR and CRP. If both are normal, then it is obviously not rheumatoid arthritis. So you give a zero score. If it is an either abnormal CRP or an abnormal ESR, even if one of these are present, then you give a point of one. Right? And duration of symptoms. If it is less than six weeks, then it is zero. For more than six weeks, it is one. So some amount of chronicity is important. So you give based on the uh, more than six weeks or less than six weeks. If it is less than six weeks, it will be zero. If it is more than six weeks, it will be one. Right? So this is the joint involvement. Uh, the classification 2020 ACR ULA classification for rheumatoid arthritis. You need to remember the criteria first of all. It is joint involvement, serology, acute phase reactants, and the duration of symptoms. Right? Joint joint involvement based on the number of joints involved. If it is less than one large, it is only one large joint, then the score will be zero. If it is more than 10 joints, including one at least one small joint, then the points will be five. In serology, you need an RA factor or an anti-CCP antibody. Based on the titers, you will give either two points or three points. Acute phase reactants, if it is an abnormal CRP or abnormal ESR, you give one point. The duration of symptoms will be more than six weeks, you give one point. If it is less than six weeks, it is zero. Right? So, based on this, when it is more than, when do you say it is definitely rheumatoid arthritis? So, when the points are more than or equal to six by 10, when the points are more than or equal to six by 10, then you call it as rheumatoid arthritis. Then you diagnose this as rheumatoid arthritis. If it's more than six by 10, then you call this as Rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Yes. Coming to the treatment. So, like in any chronic disease, the first one, without thinking, it will be very easy when you write essays in your answer papers for your, uh, you know, final year exams. So, when it is drugs involved, when, when, uh, when you call, first about, start about treatment, you first talk about the lifestyle modifications, right? You first talk about the lifestyle, lifestyle modifications, right? I told you the most important trigger will be smoking. So you need to quit smoking. So the first one will be quit smoking. This is very, very important. Quitting smoking, there is no decreasing in smoking. You need to quit smoking so that the disease will not be progressing further. You need to provide adequate rest, but also you need to do some physiotherapy, right? Rest is also important. Physiotherapy is also important to, in, to retain the mobility of the joints. So rest and physiotherapy are important. But most importantly, the patient should be aware of the disease. They should be educated about the disease. They should be aware that this is a chronic disease. It is a systemic disease. They are most likely going to complicate. So the best, the best thing will be to bring the disease under control very fast in the initial period so that the complications, the deformities, you know, the lifestyle, uh, you know, adaptability will be, will become easier later in life. Okay. So we need to do the lifestyle modifications. They should be educated. They should be very, very education is very, very important. Educated about the complications, what all can go wrong and how they should be managing. They should be told that the treatment should be appropriate so that they do not go into complications. They do not land with deformities or complications later in life. So this is very, very important. The patient should be very, very aware of this because this is a very chronic disease and the, patient should, the patient's cooperation is most important. The family's cooperation in the treatment is also very, very important. Okay, then follow a good diet. Okay, then following a good diet to these are the basic lifestyle modifications that you should be doing. Right? Yes. So, what happens? What is the, we'll come to the drugs in the later chapter, later part. Physiotherapy is very, very important. You need to keep the pain, uh, you need to keep the joint mobile. Occupational therapy is also important. If the patient has landed up in deformities, then the patient should be taught how to live with the deformities, you know, how to manage daily life with the deformities. So what do you base this treatment on? 
what are your treatment goals what are your goals for treatment why should you actually treat this rheumatoid arthritis this is because first of all you want to keep the patient pain free right you want to keep the patient pain free you should decrease the inflammation you should decrease the inflammation yes you should decrease the inflammation you should you know avoid deformities avoid deformities and you should improve the quality of life you should improve the quality of life by maintaining the activities of daily living you should improve the quality of life by improving the activities of daily living okay so for that you need physiotherapy you need occupational therapy so that you are able to maintain the quality of life yeah so what happens because initially if itself if you treat the patient the erosion will become lesser right the joint erosion will be lesser so the joint deformities will be lesser so initial stages if you are able to treat the patient you can actually reduce the erosions you can actually reduce the erosions if because of that you can prevent joint damage so it is very important to actually attack the disease in the late, early stages itself so later as the chronicity increases it is it becomes difficult to treat the patient right so you need to prevent the joint deformities and also prevent joint damage right okay so just one trivia point here what are the other, other erosive arthritis crystal arthropathies right crystal arthropathies this can also be erosive crystal arthropathies can be erosive right psoriatic arthropathies psoriatic arthritis can be erosive then rheumatoid arthritis or uh, along with sle which is called rupus arthritis rupus if sle is sle alone is non erosive arthritis but when it is present along with rheumatoid arthritis it is called rupus in that case the patient can have erosive arthritis okay so some crystal induced arthritis they can be erosive psoriatic arthritis and rupus all these are very important just to just to revise for you here okay so what are your goals to be the, to make the patient pain free there should not be any joint inflammation deformity should be avoided and it should improve the quality of life right yes next so moving on to the drugs let me talk about the drugs here first yes so what are the drugs so first what will happen the patient you will first uh, you will see that the patient is taking a lot of nsaids which is totally not indicated which is totally you know not indicated in patients with rheumatoid arthritis because it's a chronic disease you are going to in increase the morbidity for the patient so drugs like nsaids are totally avoided if at all you can give you have to you can probably give cox2 inhibitors but again these are not uh, you know indicated in these patients you know indomethacin no ibuprofen no uh, you know celecoxib betoricoxib none of these are actually indicated in these patients so because they are not going to modify the disease activity right nsaids are not going to modify the disease activity if you give nsaids temporarily the pain may go off but this is not going to modify the disease process in any way okay so what are the most important drugs that we are going to discuss these are called demands what are they demands disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs okay disease modifying disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs demands disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs so among that the most important one will be methotrexate right methotrexate you need to remember this methotrexate right first one will be methotrexate how does it act it inhibits the dihydrofolate dihydrofolate reductase right this is dihydrofolate reductase it inhibits the dihydrofolate reductase so what does it do it will decrease the joint inflammation it will actually modify the disease activity by decreasing the joint inflammation so it's an anti inflammatory drug right it's an anti inflammatory drug so the first one will be methotrexate it's a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor so what are the main adverse effects of these drugs it affects the lft lft will get deranged it can also called cause mucositis okay mucositis can be there there can be hypersensitivity so when will you actually stop the methotrexate if, if and the liver functions are involved if the liver functions are more than even the liver enzymes are more than four times elevated then you consider stopping the drug okay when the liver functions becomes more than four times normal then the uh, methotrexate should be stopped right the methotrexate sorry then the methotrexate should be stopped okay so the next drug will be when in patients with when whom methotrexate cannot be used what is the next line of drug you have to give hcq hydroxychloroquine this is for mild disease mild disease hydroxychloroquine you must keep in mind about the chloroquine toxicity 
chloroquine toxicity you should you need to keep in mind and you should monitor the patient's eyes and the renal function test frequently to avoid chloroquine toxicity in the patient so hydroxychloroquine you can use it for mild disease right the next one will be leflunamide leflunamide right leflunamide so what is this leflunamide this is dihydro orotate dehydrogenase inhibitor right this is an inhibitor of the dihydro orotate dehydrogenase so methotrexate was dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor leflunamide is dihydro orotate dehydrogenase inhibitor okay and this can cause hepatotoxicity hepatotoxic this is also hepatotoxic okay then the fourth one will be sulfa salazin sulfa salazin right sulfa salazin this we use very commonly in this you can have bone marrow suppression suppression we also saw that cytopenia with some found methotrexate also in sulfa salicin can also cause bone marrow suppression so what is the preference if you're not able to use um, methotrexate then the first choice will be leflunamide if leflunamide cannot be used then you choose sulfa salicin and the third drug will most probably be hcq okay so methotrexate the disease modifying drugs which are most commonly used are methotrexate hcq leflunamide and sulfa salicin and sulfa salicin okay so now coming on to the new ones which are biological agents biological agents now we use, it's used very very commonly so what are the biological agents like i told you you need to bring the disease activity under control very very fast so that you prevent the joint damage as a permanent thing okay so biological agents are used so what will you what will you first use anti tnf alpha i told you in the pathology you need to remember interleukin 1 antagonist interleukin 1 and anti tnf so the most commonly what we use are anti tnf alpha drugs which is something like infliximab infliximab etanercept you have adalimumab sertolizumab golimumab all these are anti tnf alpha inhibitors okay these actually reduce the joint inflammation in a very very fast time but when you use these anti tnf alpha agents you need to remember that these can active reactivate latent diseases like tuberculosis latent infections like tuberculosis so you need to be very very cautious with this it can also cause a lupus flare okay reactivate infections reactivate infections and it can also cause lupus flare okay if the patient is having rheumatoid arthritis with uh, lupus then the lupus can get flared or even if the patient is not having lupus this can cause lupus like symptoms to happen anti tnf alpha agents so this is very very important next will be interleukin 1 antagonists interleukin 1 inhibitors and the third one will be jak3 inhibitors which is which is now coming into use commonly jak3 inhibitors mainly tofacitinib or baricitinib right tofacitinib or baricitinib these are also importantly used okay so what are the biological agents mainly it is anti tnf alpha agents interleukin 1 uh, inhibitors or jak3 inhibitors which will be tofacitinib or baricitinib right yes so we are now looked, looked at the drugs nsaids have no role damars are importantly used methotrexate hcq leflunamide sulfa salicin biological agents will be anti tnf alpha agents interleukin 1 antagonists like anakindra and uh, jak3 inhibitors like tofacitinib and baricitinib okay yes so we have now seen the drugs so what are the treatment drugs will first will be lifestyle modifications then physiotherapy occupational therapy and the drugs no nsaids damards and biological agents right yes so let's you know conclude with some questions these are very very small basic questions okay so the first one a 38 year old lady i want all of you to answer the questions right a 38 year old lady with rheumatoid arthritis presented with fatigue and low white cell count wbc of 2500 she has no active joint symptoms and her rheumatoid arthritis is controlled with low dose methotrexate and nsaids on examination she has chronic joint deformity of her hands and a palpable spleen which of the following is a likely diagnosis which of the following is a likely diagnosis right which of the following is a likely diagnosis so in these patients with rheumatoid arthritis what you can do before you start the patient on the mars you can actually give a short course of like a bridging therapy you can use steroids okay, i'm just telling you here you can actually use steroids for a short duration but long term use of steroids is not indicated because of the side effects which are uh, found with that so steroids you can use for a short term period right okay so this patient is having a 38 year old lady you know 25 to 50 years rheumatoid arthritis they have already told you she has fatigue constitutional symptom is there there is a low white cell count hematologic manifestation is there no active joint symptoms and rheumatoid arthritis is controlled with low dose methotrexate she has chronic joint deformity and uh, you know there is of her hands and a palpable spleen 
So this is splenomegaly in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and a low white cell count, which is neutropenia. So what is this? Is it methotrexate toxicity? Is it cytopenia because of methotrexate? Is it rheumatoid nodules disrupting the bone marrow architecture? Do we find you know, rheumatoid nodules in the bone marrow, Felty syndrome or myelofibrosis? So this is a combination of splenomegaly, rheumatoid arthritis and neutropenia. So this is Felty syndrome, right? This is Felty syndrome. Okay. The next question, a 65-year-old man with a long history of symmetrical small joint arthritis with a uh, small joint arthritis, he now develops shortness of breath on exertion with a dry cough, but no sputum or chest discomfort. His heart sounds have a loud P2 and the lungs have a bi crackles. What is the likely diagnosis? What is the likely diagnosis? Right? What is the likely diagnosis? Yes, Dr. Joseph, it is correct. Felty, Felty syndrome. Yeah. Felty syndrome. So next, moving on to the next question. I'll repeat the question again. A 65-year-old man with a long history of symmetrical uh, small joint arthritis, he developed shortness of breath on exertion with a dry cough, but no sputum, much as discomfort. His heart sounds have a loud P2 and the lungs have fine bibesular crackles. What is the likely diagnosis? Is it pericarditis? It's a cavitatory lung lesion, pneumonia or an interstitial lung disease. So what is it? This is a very small basic question. Just for you to revise all the symptoms, right? So it is interstitial lung disease, right? So this is interstitial lung disease. So, but why do we have a loud P2? In interstitial lung disease, why do we have a loud P2? In interstitial lung disease, why do we have a loud P2? That is because interstitial lung disease causes the pulmonary artery hypertension, right? Interstitial lung disease causes pulmonary arterial hypertension. So because of that, you have a loud P2 right? Pulmonary hypertension because of interstitial lung disease. So the answer for this question is the patient is developing interstitial lung disease. Right? This is a long-term complication like pulmonary manifestation. Right. So last question, a 45-year-old lady complaining of bilateral hand pains in six months. She had 10 swollen joints. Her labs are positive for RF and anti-CCP. There are no erosions on X-ray. Which one of the following drugs is the best option? So 45-year-old lady with complaining of bilateral hand pains in six months. Then small joint in what she has had 10 small 10 swollen joints. Lab tests are positive for RF and anti CCP. There are no erosions on X ray. Which of the following drugs is the best option? So you just remember this. We'll go back to this criteria. Yes. So 10 joints are involved. So you give this patient at least five points. Then you have an RF and a positive anti CCP. So taking it as low, also, you can give the patient two points. And you find that the duration is six months, which is more than six weeks. So you give the patient one point. So five plus two plus seven plus uh, five plus two, seven, seven plus one, eight. So this will be eight. Eight points. So this is definitely rheumatoid arthritis, right? So this point, this patient is having, what I'll repeat again, the duration is more than six months, which is more than six weeks. So you give a point for that, one point for that. She has had 10 joints, 10 swollen joints. which has more than 10 swollen joints. You give a point of five, right? Lab tests are positive for RA factor and anti CCP. Yes, even if you consider it to be low positive, which they have not mentioned here, if it is low positive, you give two points for this. So, five plus two plus one, you will have eight points. So, this is definitely rheumatoid arthritis because it is more than six. If it is more than six, uh, equal to six, then it is rheumatoid arthritis. There are no erosions on the chest in, on the x ray. Which of the following drugs is the best option? So, what is the first, first line drug that you will use? We will be using methotrexate, right? The first line drug that we will be using is methotrexate, right? Okay, so just a small reminder for you. When you have a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, the first line drug that you will choose will be methotrexate along with corticosteroids. But if it is not responding to that, you can actually increase the combination. You can add aleflunamide or sulfasalazine along with methotrexate, right? If that is also not working, then you will have anti-TNF-alpha inhibitors. The first one you can either try uh, anti-TNF-alpha inhibitors like infliximab or retinacept. One of these you can try. And if that is also not working, you can actually ex escalate the dose. You can add one more uh, anti-TNF-alpha agent. And if that is also not working, you can probably try JAK3 inhibitors like tocilizumab. Okay. Or rituximab or abatacept. All these can also be tried in the later stages. So most often the disease get controlled with anti-TNF-alpha agents itself. And But what we need to remember is we need to bring the disease under control very fast so that you prevent joint disease, joint deformities and joint damage. Okay. So with that, we conclude rheumatoid arthritis. We'll continue with the next arthritis in the next uh, topic of discussion. Thank you so much for joining.
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining with us today. It was really a wonderful session and we had a very interesting and uh, interactive session with you, ma'am, today. Thank you so much. So let's hope so in uh, next uh, subsequent weeks, we will be like uh, continuing our uh, arthritis discussion and rheumatology discussion. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank all those who have joined here through the YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you.